Well, good morning to all. My name is Sandy Nectel. I work here at Alaska Communications in the Marketing Department, and we're really, really happy to have you on our webinar this morning. What is co-location and is it right for you? Uh, we're going to start the presentation in just a moment. I'm going to cover off some uh, housekeeping issues before we do so, and then I'll pass things off to our presenter, Shannon Hogan. Uh, but as I mentioned, we're excited to have such a large group on the phone this morning. Uh, at this point, you should be dialed into a phone number as well as accessing the presentation via ReadyTalk. Um, you can see the information in the slide if you don't have the dial-in. If you're on the dial-in, go to ReadyTalk.com using the access code 5641744. Uh, with that being said, today's presentation will be quick. We want to respect your busy schedules. Uh, it's a 30-minute webinar. Approximately 20 to 22 of that will be a presentation from Shannon, leaving about 8 to 10 minutes for Q&A at the end. Um, you have all been muted, uh, so you will not be able to submit questions via voice, but you all have access to a live chat feature of ReadyTalk, and you're welcome to submit your questions throughout the presentation. We will handle those at the end during the Q&A session. So if you either need technical support or if you have any questions you'd like to submit, please use the live chat feature. Uh, to answer everyone's first question, we will be making this presentation available to all participants in a recorded fashion in the next few days, so no need to uh, spend all your time uh, writing down copious notes. You'll get all of this, but feel free to take notes on what you find important and valuable. And uh, for those of you who are really interested in winning the Zoom tablet, which is a fantastic device, uh, you do need to be present at the end of the webinar today. Uh, the drawing will take place at that time. I will randomly select a, select a name from the list of folks that I can see visible as attendees on our ReadyTalk uh, webinar uh, software here. So if I, don't, if I can't see your name, you're not eligible to win. So if you drop off halfway through, unfortunately, your name will not be visible to me. So with that setting, and introduce our product manager uh, or presenter today. Uh, Shannon Hogan is our Director of Product Management here at Alaska Communications. She's got a great presentation here on co-location and is it right for you. And with that said, I'll hand it over to Shannon. So please take it away, Shannon. Well, good morning, everybody. And I know that you're probably mostly here for the opportunity to win the Motorola Zoom at the end of the session. But I'll try to at least give you a little information and keep you informed while we have the webinar presentation itself. We're going to talk about co-location and discuss some of the aspects of it so that you can make an informed decision and consideration about whether or not you should be thinking about trying to use co-location space as part of how you organize and arrange your IT infrastructure. But just to make sure that we have a balanced workload this morning, I'd like to start by asking a question of the uh, group. Uh, you should be seeing on your, uh, on your screens now just a question about kind of where you're currently uh, locating the servers in your business. So if you could just uh, do a quick answer here, uh, that would be some good information for us to, uh, to see kind of where people are. And looks like from the uh, results that are coming back here that the majority of you have your servers now um, it's kind of shuffling back and forth, somewhere between in your office and in a data center or in some other locations. So that's good. That's good. It looks like we have some of the, you know, the two major choices well represented in this group. So great. So let's go ahead and let's start talking about uh, co-location. First, before you can decide whether or not it's right for you, we should agree on a definition of what is it. And for the terms of this presentation, we're going to be meaning that your servers and related IT equipment are located in a data center provided by a third party as part is the definition of co-location. So if you've put it in a data center uh, offered by a third party, that fits our definition of having put your servers in a, in a co-location space. Now, why would you be wanting to consider doing that? Um, it's actually an opportunity for you to locate your critical equipment in a reliable, scalable, secure environment. Um, and it's generally pretty tough to be able to afford to duplicate the kind of IT environment, IT friendly environment in your own office as you can get in a, in a co-location center. And just to, uh, just to kind of give you a, a quick idea of what's included in co-location center, I've got a table here showing Alaska Communications and what it is that we offer within our data centers. But let's walk through and, and talk through what are the different aspects of a data center that you should be looking for as you are making the consideration of co-location. 
And there's sort of three main categories um, of, uh, of facilities or capabilities that a data center provides that you don't find in the typical office space. Um, one of them uh, has to do around the, uh, the general space itself, uh, the, the uh, building and the environment. Um, one of them has to do with the um, uh, power capabilities. And then the, uh, the final area that we'll talk about is some of the aspects of the actual environment within the physical structure. First thing in a co-location space is you will typically see a design that uses hot and cold aisles. Uh, IT equipment generates a lot of heat, and nearly all IT equipment has fans incorporated into it. So it's pulling air into the, into the unit, into the server, into the disk array, into the whatever piece of equipment is. Fans pull air into that, blow it through, and exhaust it out the back of the equipment. What a, a data center design principle of hot coal aisles does is basically try to maximize the effectiveness of having hot aisles and cold aisles. The cold aisles are the ones that have the particular fans and delivery systems for the chilled air going down the cold aisle. All the equipment down the rows of cabinets are, that are facing so that the air intake fans are pulling the air off the cold aisle. And then it all exhausts out on the back side into a hot aisle so that you're maximizing the cool temperature of the air going into the equipment to help keep it cool and keep your equipment at that ideal operating temperature. Another fairly standard principle that's used in designing data centers is the usage of raised floors so that the cabling and uh, various routing and electrical connections and data cabling connections and all of those cables that you get when you've got a lot of data and IT equipment is very uh, tidy, stored in, a, in a, nice, uh, a nice way where it's well labeled but it's out of the way so that you don't, uh, you don't need to worry about accidental disconnects or other things occurring. So hot cold aisles and raised floors, common principles that you'll see um, are incorporated into almost all data center designs. There's other things that are important, though, about data center designs that have to do with not only providing a good environment for the equipment in terms of the physical sense, but also providing a good environment in terms of the security that is being offered. So you typically find that access to data centers are uh, controlled, frequently by badges or other mechanisms such as that, so that you can have 24-7 access to the data center, but not everybody can just walk up and do that. Uh, it's a little more convenient than having to use keys on locks and so forth. So badged access is, is frequently, uh, frequently used, but some method of controlling access into the data center. Then because we're talking about co-location, co-location is when you purchased rack space and you're actually putting your own equipment into that rack. Well, you need to be able to visit it and do things to it. But you want to have not only the facility access controlled, but also the access to your specific equipment. So it needs to be going into a cabinet that is locked or otherwise has security mechanisms attached to it so that not everyone who's allowed into the data center can actually access your equipment. You first control and limit access to people who have their equipment in the data center, have a right to access the facility, and then you control the access to your own specific equipment within the data center. On top of that, then, it's, it's very frequent and customary to assume that there would be cameras, both external cameras, usually doing monitoring of the parking lot and the physical area surrounding the building, as well as internal cameras, frequently ceiling-mounted cameras that give a view into the data center down the aisles so that, uh, you know, in case there is any unauthorized activity occurring, it's, it's recorded on the, uh, on the security monitoring. So just layers of protection to ensure that you've got um, good security around your equipment. A final thing that is also not unusual is for data centers that are staffed 24-7, 
there is frequently then an additional layer of security uh, requiring you to do like a physical sign-in. So not only do you have to show your badge to get in to the facility itself, you need to sign in with the staff that is on site, and you need to be able then to access your own, uh, uh, your own individual cabinet. So the more layers of security that are offered by a data center, and these do vary a lot, the more uh, confident you can be that the, your equipment is being physically secured as well as operating in an environment that's properly cooled and so forth. Now the next key thing that people look for in a data center that is a step up from what you might be experiencing if you've got your servers in your own office, for example, is to make sure that there is safe, reliable, conditioned power being delivered to your equipment at all times. And um, there's a lot of studies done and a lot of information that shows that power and the reliability and the conditioned um, aspect of the power is one of the things that determines the overall life of the equipment perhaps more than almost any other factor. So nice, good, clean power, no brownouts, no surges, no, no falls, no spikes or peaks, uh, no valleys, just nice, good, clean, steady power is what you're looking for. Data centers generally receive their power first from the local power company, the same place that your office building is receiving power, or your home for that matter. So there's commercial power feeds feeding into the data center, and those are always sized appropriately for a data center. Data centers tend to pull a lot more than you know, your average building because of the equipment and the power hungry nature of most IT equipment. The second thing that you would expect to see in a data center then is a secondary line of power, generally UPS and our uninterruptible power supplies or batteries that are linked into the commercial power feed that condition the power make sure that you know, there's no peaks and valleys in it, keeps it nice, smooth, steady, and delivering conditioned power into the data center. And the purpose of these is not to be able to provide unending power to the data center if you lose the commercial power feed due to some sort of power outage. Their purpose is to hold the power and provide smooth power to the data center while your final line of defense for a power outage comes into play, which will be generally a generator. And you're looking for a lot of times to make sure that there's redundancy in all of these elements so that if one fails, there's others that can carry the power for the, uh, for the data center, but that you have a nice smooth transition. You've got the commercial power, you've got your UPS and your batteries providing the transitional power, and then if it's necessary, the generators kick in. The UPS hold over the power during that interval of time, which is usually only between 30 seconds to 60 seconds before the generators are up, running, and delivering a steady source of power. But you usually have several minutes, 30 minutes or more of power available on the UPS just to make sure that that transition, there's plenty of time to make that happen safely. And then you want to make sure that you investigate, too, what the size of the tanks are for the generators and what the refueling plan is. People out on the East Coast right now who are recovering from Irene you know, some of them are only losing their power for a half a day, um, 12 hours. Some people are going to be without power for 24, 36, you know, 48 hours. And you want to make sure that if you've got your stuff and you've gone to the expense and the trouble and the planning to go into a data center, that that data center has a sufficient uh, plan for fueling to make sure that it maintains its power and keeps those generators up and running. No good to you if the generator runs for eight hours, runs out of fuel, and, uh, and drops power. You're only marginally better off then than what you might have been if you were in your office. So you want to make sure there's a long-term fueling plan for that generator as well. Then to continue on the general theme of you want to make sure that a data center is providing an appropriate and a safe environment, um, fire suppression is an important consideration in a data center. Nearly all data centers are protected by fire suppression systems, Halon, Freon, or others, that are designed specifically for electrical equipment. That means that they are not water-based sprinkler systems. They're fire suppression systems that use um, other mechanisms to uh, suppress a fire in case there should be one. This makes sure that uh, if there is a fire, it is quickly controlled and, and extinguished, 
but that there's not extensive damage done not from the fire, but from the water sprinklers going off. And certainly there have been many, many sad tales and, and stories told about people losing their office equipment, not because of a fire in the building, but because of the sprinkler systems going off. And um, sprinkler systems sometimes can go off inadvertently, um, as well as because being triggered by a fire. So you've really got to watch out to keep water away from your electrical equipment. And the, uh, the final thing is, as we were discussing with the hot cold aisles and other things, we all know servers and other IT equipment generate a lot of heat. So you want to have HVAC units that are designed for data center type environments that have the, um, and generally you want to have them be redundant as well. You want to have duplicates of as many of these systems as possible. So in case there's a failure of one, everything carries on with the redundant systems. But you want to have um, data center class HVAC units doing the temperature and humidity control. Again, all of this goes together to make sure that your environment is as close to ideal as possible as the equipment manufacturers would specify and therefore is extending the life of your equipment, the useful life of your equipment, as well as making sure that your equipment is online and operating when you need it. I didn't want to go into a lot of detail about it, but I do want to do just a quick reference to the fact that you will hear a lot of discussion about tiers when you're talking about data centers. And the tiers run a little opposite of what you would expect. Tier one, or what many people would assume would be the top tier, is actually kind of the lowest level of service being delivered by a data center. And as you move up and the numbers get larger, we're talking about more redundant, more reliable, and usually more expensive data center space. So um, most data centers are somewhere between Tier 2 and Tier 3. There are a few that are starting to come out that meet the Tier 4 requirements. But quite frankly, um, unless you are a government, a defense contractor, or um, otherwise in a uh, very, very large um, financial services industry, for example, or fa for, uh, for example, Tier 4 is probably not going to be required to meet your needs. What you're generally going to be evaluating is the cost effectiveness of uh, Tier 2 and Tier 3 types of uh, infrastructures. And while the tiers themselves come with SLAs in terms of availability, you also want to peel that back, and we'll talk about that, uh, in terms of what other SLAs are being offered by the specific data center. So um, it, while it's, it's good to look at and understand what the tier definitions are, what you really need to be doing as you start to consider data centers is look at what the needs of your business might be. Um, so what to consider for your company? Um, it, it really depends. Um, and it starts with how many critical servers and other pieces of IT equipment do you have in your business? And if you look at the picture on the upper right, there might be some things that could be done in that business relative to cable management. But the reality of it is, if you've got only one or two servers in your business, then depending on other factors, it may just turn out to be, though, that as long as you're doing off-site backup and recovery, for example, that keeping the servers in your office is cost-effective and an appropriate decision for your business to make. But if you've got a server room or a closet or the corner of an office in your office that looks like the picture on the, on the lower right-hand side, well, then, then you're, you're looking at where it may actually be a cost-effective decision for you to make to make the move out of your office into a data center. And some of the things that you should start to consider is um, what is the current life of your equipment? Do you think there's damage occurring to your equipment because the heat is out of control in where you're storing your equipment? Are you seeing equipment failures that are more frequent or more common than what you would normally expect? Um, and start to think about, too, of what if you lost uh, power to your office for an hour? How much is that going to cost you? Uh, is it worthwhile? Do you have remote workers or the ability to re work remotely 
where you can move out of your office, work from home, as long as your servers were up and running someplace else. Uh, we recently had a power failure here in Anchorage uh, over in the area of town where our Anchorage data center is located. Everything that was in our data center, of course, was up and running because of the UPS and the generators, while commercial power to the entire neighborhood and a several square mile area was out um, because of commercial power failure. So if you can work remotely, as long as your servers are up, that's the thing that starts to tip you more toward making an analysis that would say it's cost effective for you to possibly move your equipment into a data center. And I would like to reference you to um, a document that we have up on our website under our, it's actually under our disaster recovery uh, category, but it's in our, our general portfolio where we have all of our, our hosting offers such as co-location listed. And this particular uh, paper was put together to help walk businesses through the activity of putting together a disaster recovery plan. How do you determine what your recovery point objective is and what your recovery time objective is? And it gives some real good tips and, and helpful hints on how to calculate the cost to your business of downtime. And it's taking that cost to your business of downtime looking at solutions like co-location to see if it may turn out to be that given the cost of the electricity uh, adder that you're paying in your office because of the, um, of the electrical uh, load that's placed by your IT equipment, that it could be more cost effective for you to actually put your equipment in the, in the data center than it is leaving it in your office. Uh, and for example, Maybe you need the office space. And office space, as we all know, is generally designed for people. Data centers are designed for equipment. So there's a variety of things to consider. And walking through a disaster recovery plan, as I said, is frequently a good way to kind of walk through looking at the cost of your business, helping you then make decisions about co-location, as well as other kinds of solutions that you might be wanting to put in place for your IT infrastructure. It all comes down, though, to being a smart consumer. Um, choose your vendors carefully. Um, make sure that they're a reliable um, vendor that's been in the business, that has a history of being able to deliver the kinds of services that you're looking to purchase from them. Um, you know, you don't want to you don't want to go buy uh, buy tires from uh, some fly-by-night company that's you know, gotten their tires off, that fell off the back of a truck, and you don't want to go trust all your IT infrastructure to a company that doesn't have a history and a record, a proven record of being able to deliver what you need. You also want to look for a vendor who offers flexibility um, in co-location as in a lot of other things. It's not a one-size-fits-all kind of thing. You've got small companies, you've got big companies. You need to find a vendor who offers a breadth of capabilities for you. Uh, also, other services that they might have. And you should always, always look for somebody who's willing to put some financial teeth behind their SLAs. Make sure they're financially committed just as you are financially committed. So just as uh, final closing, I'd like to uh, mention the fact that Alaska Communications does have two data centers. We have one here in Anchorage, Alaska. We have another in Hillsboro, Oregon. So we're able to serve our customers across a variety of geographies, and uh, we'd be more than happy to talk with you about what your needs might be, answer some of your questions, and as I indicated, we have a number of documents on our website to help you be um, more educated, become more educated about these topics. Thanks very much for your time today. Well, thank you, Shannon. Uh, that was a, a wonderful presentation. Uh, as I mentioned at the beginning of the call, we're going to go to a Q&A session at this point in time. Uh, I am seeing a few questions pop in here on the, on the chat feature. I'd encourage you, if you have a question that we're not answering, please type that out. We'd love to, uh, we'd love to hear from you. The first question we got uh, was uh, from someone asking about building security and around how good the background checks are for employees that we have staffing uh, and serving as security within our facilities. Uh, we do background checks on all of our employees who have access to our data security, I mean to our data centers. We store all of our own internal systems in our data centers. So it's, um, you know, we're right in there with our customers and care very much. So we do background checks on all of them. And uh, then 
Next question we've got basically is regards to experience with municipalities and whether there are extra provisions in uh, place for functions like police force and their server requirements. Uh, yes, we do have some experience and there's a variety of different things that can be done in those cases. Sometimes you put up extra cages so you fence off particular areas within a data center to provide one more aspect of physical security around the equipment. There's a variety of things that we can do and have done. Uh, another question we got here is regarding the range of SLAs that we offer here at Alaska Communications. Uh, our SLAs are centered around availability, power availability, um, the uh, cooling availability. So it's kind of the key fundamental capabilities of the data center space that we're providing. And we do have financial commitments around those so that if for some reason we miss the SLA, uh, you do get money back. There is a financial compensation involved. Uh, we have another question with regards to um, how Alaska Communications uh, data center facilities are, are differentiated from, from other offerings. How they're differentiated from other offerings? Um, Perhaps in Alaska was from this particular gentleman. Okay. So uh, one is we have one of the very few uh, data centers that makes space available to customers in the Anchorage area. There's a variety of other uh, data centers certainly down in, in the uh, lower 48. Uh, it's a much more limited choice up here in Alaska. But we also layer on top of that uh, Alaska communication services such as remote hands. When you go into a data center, uh, it's great that you still have physical access to your equipment, but we also offer the capability since ours are staffed 24-7, if you need somebody to walk over to your cabinet and you know, push a reset button or, or do some simple task. And if you've authorized us to do that and allowed us access, we can certainly perform those remote tasks. So we try to lay, layer some extra service and support on top of just the physical space. Uh, I've got a question from a gentleman I'm guessing outside of uh, Alaska and the West Coast uh, regarding to uh, Alaska and Oregon and other parts of the Pac Northwest are obviously on the West Coast. Do we have any plans for expansion into the Midwest or East Coast at this time? Um, right now we're investigating some partnerships uh, so that we might be able to offer co-location space in other areas, but we are focused in delivering our own service directly to the two data centers that we have in Oregon and Alaska. Uh, for a few more questions here. I'm, I'm loving the chat coming in, guys. Keep it up. Uh, we have a question from a gentleman asking, uh, should a challenge arise as to the security compliance of the data center? Is there a way to check records for a specific rack area to prove access compliance? Um, we right now have our cameras set up so that we get uh, video recordings of all aisles uh, and all, therefore all human access, uh, physical access to the cabinets. Those are stored right now on a 30-day record. Um, if there was a customer with particular requirements uh, around a storage interval that would be longer than 30 days, for example, that would be something certainly we could discuss. Uh, next question I'm seeing is regards to, uh, besides company authorized personnel, what other individuals within the data center generally have access to the customer's individual cabinet? Right now, um, we have fairly, you know, strictly controlled. It's, it's our own personnel has access to the data center, and customers who are using our data center facilities have access to the data center. Uh, customers that are not using our co-location space, that are just using like our virtual servers or our storage uh, capabilities or whatever, uh, they have no need to physically access that equipment and therefore don't have access to the data center. So it's, uh, it's strictly restricted to people who have a need to be in the data center. And then the cabinets all have dual locks on them. There's a key lock and a combination lock. And so without access uh, to the rack, the cabinet, and it's a full uh, screened sided cabinet, there's no way to physically touch any of the equipment in the cabinet without unlocking it first and opening the door. Got a couple questions that come in here, Shannon, with regards to um, uh, building construction and earthquake compliance. Uh, yes, these buildings are constructed under earthquake codes. I don't, can't remember the uh, exact date of the construction of the East Wire Center, but um, but we they are constructed under earthquake codes. And as I said, we've put all of our own facilities in there. 
Uh, I'm going to ask one more question. Do our drawing here. Um, what sort of uptime has Alaska Communications had in the past? Uh, our uptime record has been excellent. Um, since we entered the data center business, we have not had an outage at our data center. And um, prior to officially going into the data center business when we were simply using the space for our own use, I know we go back several years without having had an outage. Wonderful. So to respect everyone's time, we're going to go to our Motorola Zoom drawing. I do want to direct you to uh, an email address that was on the last slide uh, before I do so. Should any of you have any questions, you can email us at tellmemore at acsalaska.com. Uh, that is something should you have any questions that we didn't get to today, or if you have any desire in learning more about our capabilities and how they may be able to help you or your business, we'd love to hear from you. As I mentioned, we'll make this information available, but we'd love to hear from you. So tell me more at acsalaska.com.